we learn of his early compositions at school, of the sureness of his beat, and of how the otherwise quiet and ordinary looking boy gave himself up in the most lively way to the impressions of the lovely symphony we were playing. This is reputed to be a likeness of Schubert at the age of 16, and Sporn and his other friends were to ensure we have many memorials of Schubert's life, both at school and afterwards. At the end of 1813, Schubert left the seminary and returned to the crowded family apartment in the Saulengasse. For the academic year of 1813 to 14, he attended St. Anna's College, a nearby teacher training establishment, and thereafter he worked as a schoolmaster with his father. Schubert had little patience for the job and probably didn't care for it, but at first it seemed the only way for him to live. Apparently more than 300 pupils crowded into the school at the peak of its success. He kept closely in touch with Sporn and his other friends. Johann Meerhofer was a poet and introduced to Schubert by Sporn. Schubert was to set many of his poems, and the two, although very different in character, were later to share rooms for some time. Meerhofer was moody and introspective, in contrast to Schubert's outgoing charm. Another new friend was Franz Schober, whom Schubert was most fond of among all his friends. Schober was a wealthy dilettante who followed various professions from actor and painter to civil servant at different times. He was charming, unstable, irreligious and frivolous. He appealed to Schubert immensely and although he was not greatly loved by the other friends, Schubert and Schober, Schobert as they called themselves, remained close to the end of Schubert's life. During 1814, his time at the training college and his first taste of teaching, Schubert was composing steadily. He produced, in fact, a torrent of music, a symphony, six string quartets, piano pieces, orchestral pieces, and over 50 songs. He could apparently write, no matter what was going on around him, and what emerged seemed to need little correction. The German poet Goethe was then at the height of his fame and Schubert set one of the poems from Goethe's play, Faust, Gretchen am Spinnade, Gretchen at the Spinning Wheel. It was written in October 1814, when he was 17. There is not much to say about Gretchen, except that it is a perfect and stunning example of Schubert's genius. During 1815, Schubert was teaching hundreds of little boys and writing more music, more than 200 works, ranging from songs to symphonies. Amongst the songs was Haydn Roslein, Hedge Roses, another Goethe setting, and one of the loveliest songs Schubert wrote. He followed that with The Earl King, Earl König, an amazing tour de force. If an excuse for all this outpouring of music is needed, it is reputed that Schubert was in love with a local girl, Therese Grob, here pictured in later life. Schubert was extremely reticent about such love affairs as he may have had. Maybe Therese was the love of his life. We have little evidence to go by, however, and certainly nothing came of it. For a composer whose greatest success included some wonderful love songs, feelings of the heart must have been a great significance to him. In the autumn of 1816, Schubert gave up schoolmastering and moved to live in Schober's apartment in town. Schober's mother and sister welcomed him and Schober's cosmopolitan background, he was born in Sweden of German Austrian parents, his wit, his amoral views and his charming behavior suited Schubert and contrasted strongly with the rather Puritan world of his own family. Schober undoubtedly led Schubert into a way of life he might not otherwise have met. 
their riotous enjoyment of Vienna's brothels gave Schubert the syphilis which was to hasten the end of his life. But Schubert never ceased to value his friend Schober. Schober wrote the words of Andy Musik to music, one of Schubert's greatest songs, and written this time. It's a wonderful melody, but it's the wholeness of the piano part, the voice part, and the words together that make up Schubert's unique achievement. Schober also drew this cartoon of his friend Schubert and a very tall man called Johann Michael Vogel. Vogel was a high baritone of great distinction at the Vienna Opera. The friends decided that Schubert's wonderful songs needed a singer. When Vogel met Schubert and came to know and love the songs, he couldn't believe that this little man, Schubert was more than a foot shorter than Vogel, could produce such beautiful music. Vogel became the great exponent of Schubert's songs, and the two became close friends. Vogel, like many others, thought that the useful Schubert's music came to him as in a clairvoyant experience. Schubert worked so quickly, wrote with little correction. How could it be otherwise? Sporn, however, would have none of this. He knew Schubert to be a master musician who knew his craft and had studied all the works of Handel, Mozart, Haydn, Beethoven. There was no trick to it, just genius and hard work. The world of Vienna, particularly after the unsettling scares of Napoleon, had opted with great determination for comfortable, romantic, bourgeois values. It was an immensely attractive world, and one of which music was an intrinsic part. It seemed nearly everyone sang or played instruments with no little skill. For an aspiring composer, it was a perfect time to be alive. In 1815, while the young Schubert was composing Earl König, Vienna was holding its congress to decide the political fate of the peoples of the empire. The eyes of the world were on it, and native pride, wit, and fashion rose to the occasion. As always, church music was a way forward for a composer. Schubert was to struggle unsuccessfully with this medium. The patronage of the princes of the church was still extremely important in music, but religion and Schubert sat uneasily together. The opera, then as now, was at the center of musical life, but light opera and above all Italian opera was what people wanted. Schubert went on to write 17 German operas. He worked on no less than seven in 1815. Only three in all reached the stage and they all failed due largely to poor librettos. The Kettner Tor Theatre commissioned an opera from him and Die Zwillingsbruder, the twin brothers, was the result, though it wasn't performed until 1820 and then only for six performances. In 1818, Schubert was offered a job as music tutor to the two young daughters of Count Johann Karl Esterhazy at their Hungarian summer home of Zilich. It got him away from home, and it helped keep him alive. His stay in Zilich also means we have some letters to his friends, in which he reveals much of the charm and liveliness which endeared him to them. This journey to Hungary was as far as Schubert travelled in his life. There was no one there who had much feeling for art, except, he suspected, the Countess, and he missed the company of his friends. Back in Vienna in 1819, Schubert went off for the first of several holidays with his friend, the singer Vogel. At Vogel's expense, they went to Steyr, Vogel's birthplace, and a charming town about 90 miles west of Vienna.
On this visit, they met the musical patron of the town, Sylvester Baumgartner, who immediately commissioned Schubert to write a chamber work they could perform.